Hey guys, Jerome at 18 Minute Fitness Personal Training Studio, and today I'm going to give a brief presentation before any and all questions that are in the chat, but I'm going to be talking about why cardio sucks in terms of uh, weight loss. I um, also want to touch on a few things. One, I know I'm wearing my jacket. Um, I keep my studio as cold as I possibly can uh, because I think once somebody is warmed up and they're exercising, that's a better environment for uh, exercise. Um, and I'm also really cheap. So in an effort to try and keep my heating bill down, I basically keep my thermostat off in the business. So looking at the thermostat now, it's 59 in here. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit chilly. Um, so again, I'm going to give a brief presentation today. We are going to watch a few snippets from some videos, and then I will take any and all questions that pop up in the chat. So with that being said, let's make sure we have this all set and let's get into it as soon as I can figure out my technology here. <laughs> all right. Cardio sucks for weight loss. Um, weight loss and fat loss are not the same thing, but given how conventionally the two are used interchangeably, um, I'm going to use them as such. Uh, I understand fat loss carries a certain connotation. People don't like the word fat. Um, that's why they use weight loss. I get it. I, I generally try and be pretty precise with terminology, but um, for all intents and purposes today, the two terms are going to be used interchangeably. So just to put everything out there, you don't need cardio for fat loss. These two pictures on the left are me. Um, on the left here was, uh, that was Easter. Shortly after my daughter was born, I was almost 300 pounds. The picture on the right was a little bit later. I think I lost something like 89 pounds in one year without doing cardio. And the next picture is a client of mine, Matt, who came to me with a 40 inch waist. Um, and over six months, hopefully me in the bottom right hand corner of my camera isn't blocking it too much. But Matt lost 50 pounds in six months without doing any cardio at all. Started lifting three days a week. And by the time that we finished our time together, he was only exercising once every 10 to 14 days with no cardio. So no, you don't need cardio for fat loss. And today I really want to break down why I think it's a really poor approach to try and lose weight or to try and lose fat. So the conventional model that's uh, being promulgated by most authorities in health and fitness now is that fat loss or fat gain is all about calorie balance, right? You have to eat less, move more. That's kind of the mainstream notion. And these two concepts are so intertwined that I'll be discussing both briefly today. I mostly wanted to do this video talking about why I think cardio is a bad approach towards fat loss or weight loss. Um, but this whole idea is so wrapped up together, eat less, move more, that I'm going to be touching on both. My first issue is that this idea of calories in, calories out, it's kind of tautological. Um, it's it's circular. It's, it's If you're gaining weight, you're told that you're in a calorie surplus. Well, how do you know that you're in a calorie surplus? Well, see if you're gaining weight. You're just using one term to define the other. So if anyone tells you to just eat a calorie deficit, then it's, it's vacuous. They're telling you to just eat an amount that you know that you're going to be losing weight in or losing fat in. Um, but more conventionally, more broad scope, because of people... Uh, often misappropriating uh, fat gain or fat loss to the you know laws of thermodynamics, um, it's often seen that a calorie surplus is seen as a state of an energy surplus. And I'm going to make a point in a slide or two that I don't think this is the case, despite this being kind of the main held belief around energy. If you have too much energy, that energy has to go somewhere, so it's stored as fat, um, is kind of the whole idea that we're going to touch on in a little bit. My view on calories is there one way to loosely measure food. You could get similar results to the calories in calories out model just by weighing your total food intake and then reducing the amount of food intake that you eat over time. The numbers I've seen say something like the average American eats between four and five pounds of food a day. And if there's some truth to this, telling people that just cut calories or be in a calorie deficit is the same thing then as just saying, well, if you normally eat five pounds of food a day, take it to four and a half pounds of food a day. And, oh, you're not losing weight on four and a half pounds a day, then take it down to four pounds a day. This is the same thing that the calorie approach um, basically advocates. It's one way of loosely measuring food intake. And of course, uh, making a significant reduction in food intake is going to have some effect on weight loss over time. But this is the same kind of mindset that allows for points counting carbs, counting macros, you know, Weight Watchers, Atkins, they're all different ways to measure different aspects of food and then gradually reduce food intake over time 
if that becomes necessary. It, it's one way to kind of go down this road of shifting your body composition. Food labels also can be off 20%. Uh, this is hammered home pretty hard in the carnivore community, so I'm not going to dwell on that too long. It also doesn't account for the thermic effect of food, waste, you know, the stuff that you eat that you don't absorb that goes out the other end. Uh, the calories in, calories out model doesn't really account for that. And I also don't think it comports the science of what we know about physiology. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this presentation is talking about the work of uh, Herman Ponser. He wrote a book called Burn, which kind of advocates a new approach towards metabolism. Ponser lived with the Hadza for quite some time. They're a modern gather or sorry, modern hunter gatherer tribe. And he used doubly laced water to measure basically the amount of uh, calories that they're burning every single day as a way to track their metabolism. And then he also put GPS trackers on them to see how active they were being. And he found that the average Hadza, despite walking like six to 12 miles a day, climbing trees, hunting animals, being physically active all day, the average Hadza burned the same number of calories or had the same total daily energy expenditure as the average sedentary American, despite the average Hadza doing more activity in one day than most Americans do in one week. And these results were replicated across different populations all over the globe. Now, they also, just as an intellectual curiosity, um, used the same doubly laced water to measure metabolisms of different animals, but that's not really relevant uh, to this particular conversation. Um, so Ponser, sorry, I was thinking about a point, but I know it's a bullet point, a couple points down excuse me, proposed what he called the constrained daily energy expenditure model, which basically suggests that your body will, in a sense, downregulate your metabolism as a response to activity. His results with the Hadza, with Americans, and with other people that have replicated his, re his research all across the globe suggest that body size and composition are the best indicators of your total daily energy expenditure. He makes a uh, a couple of points in this book with other studies he's done. One of them, he tracked marathon runners. And these people, I believe, had six months or so to basically get ready and start running marathons on a regular basis and go through all the training that goes into that. Mm -hmm. And he found that with the first week of activity, with running something like 40 miles a week, um, their activity matched what the calories in, calories out model would predict. Their total daily energy expenditure went way up. But after tracking them for 140 days, he found that their metabolism slowed by 20%. And I gave the page number for the reference in case you want to pick up this book. So I'm a big believer that weight loss is hormonally mediated. And I'm going to give a really, really oversimplification of a lot of really complicated hormonal processes on the next slide. I'm not trying to say these are all the factors that go into it. Um, if you really want to have a better understanding of metabolism, of physiology, go subscribe and watch Bart K. He knows these things and he does a better job communicating these very complicated processes um, in much greater detail than anybody else I've seen on YouTube. So go listen to everything Bart has to say and know that what I'm going to say on this slide, maybe the next slide, are a vast and gross oversimplification of very complicated processes. But I'm trying to give kind of a simple explanation of how I believe these things actually work. So elevated insulin blocks lipolysis in the adipocyte, which is your fat cell, independent of available energy or independent of calories. And we're going to look at some sources in a bit by Jason Fung, um, but also Dr. Benjamin Bickman from uh, Brigham Young University, who I believe is one of the foremost experts, at least in the United States, with respect to insulin research. And Bickman is very, very quick to say that it doesn't matter how much energy is available around the cell. If insulin is up, your fat cells will not break down body fat. And having a loose understanding of what ketosis is, I think substantiates this position too. Uh, we talk about ketogenic diets, but let's give a really quick, you know, 60 second breakdown of what ketosis actually is. When you fast or when you don't eat for a period of time, or if you completely cut or drastically cut carbohydrates out of your diet for a period of time, your blood sugar will go down because you're not getting carbohydrates from your diet. Um, your blood sugar will start to get a little bit lower. This causes hepatic, which is liver glycogenolysis. Your liver stores glucose or sugar 
in a storage form called glycogen. When your blood sugar gets low, your body says we need to get this back to where it needs to go. So your liver releases sugar in your bloodstream to get it back to where it needs to be. But these glycogen stores in your liver, your liver only has so much. And as these storages start getting a little bit low, this stimulates the release of glucagon, which is a signaling hormone. Glucagon signals lipolysis in the adipocytes, which are your fat cells. And glucagon is one of a couple of hormones that can stimulate this pathway. But basically, hormone-sensitive lipase inside your fat cells triggers the breakdown of triglycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol, which are released in your bloodstream. These free fatty acids can be absorbed by cells and used for metabolism, but some of them make it to the liver and are converted to ketones. Ketones, and there's three ketone bodies, but ketones are basically two acetyl coenzyme A molecules. And acetyl coenzyme A is used for the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle inside your mitochondria. These ketones then, once they're made in the liver, get released into the bloodstream and they just float around in your bloodstream for any cells that need to absorb them to use them for energy, uh, for oxidation in the mitochondria. Excess ketones, ones that aren't picked up and used by cells are eventually eliminated from the body through your breath or through your urine. This is why they talk about keto breath or why you can use urinary ketone strips to test the level of ketones in your pee. This means though, if you have ketones, not only in your blood, but also being excreted through your breath and through your urine, this means your body is in a state of energy surplus. We have all of, we have an abundance of energy. We, or at least potential energy, um, and it's so abundant that our body says, we don't need some of this. We can afford to get rid of it. And this can happen you know, while you're fasting, while you're losing body fat. So you can be in a state of energy surplus in a sense, because our body is saying we have so much energy, we can afford to get rid of some um, and still be losing body fat. So this whole idea that a calorie surplus is basically a state of energy surplus, I don't think is true. And I don't think it really holds up to the scrutiny. What I think the calories in, calories out model is trying to say. This picture on the left um, shows glucose and insulin response to macronutrients. When you eat carbohydrates, all carbohydrates are converted to sugar. This raises your blood sugar and insulin is released to try and shunt this sugar into your muscles, in your liver, and in your fat cells because elevated blood sugar is acutely toxic. It's potentially dangerous to the body. So when you eat carbohydrate, you get a big increase in glucose and you get a big increase in insulin. And because insulin acts very quickly on it, it goes down very quickly. When you eat a decent bolus of protein, this also has a somewhat insulinogenic and gluconeogenic response. Some of the amino acids that you eat are converted into glucose. This raises blood sugar a little bit and insulin is also released to try and store this blood sugar. And fat, interestingly enough, has a really, really minimal effect on blood sugar or blood insulin levels. Um, and Ben Bickman has talked about this. He said something along the lines of, it takes many, many hundreds of calories of eating fat to get the slightest bump in your insulin level. And the picture on the right, and I'll tie these two pictures together in a bit, everything in the red kind of above basal levels represents a fat storage mode. And everything in the green represents a fat burning mode. So when you eat fat, you get a little bit of a bump little tiny bit of fat storage, and then you're in fat burning mode for a while. When you eat protein, it's a little bit more pronounced, and then you get this little tiny bit of uh, fat burning mode. And then when you eat carbohydrate, you get a big spike, but it's also dealt with a little bit more quickly. And then fasting finally on the right represents uh, no increases in blood sugar or insulin, and you're just functioning off of body fat. So I suspect, and I could be very wrong about this, and I'm perfectly welcome to correction. I suspect with um, respect to gaining body fat, it's not so much the size of the spike that matters, but the area under the curve. Whoop. Oh, geez. Sorry about that. Let me go back a bit. Okay. What I think really matters is probably the area under the curve only from a body composition point of view. Now, again, this little bump in protein doesn't account for the thermic effect of protein. Uh, it doesn't affect, or sorry, it doesn't account for how a lot of amino acids that your body can't utilize go to the liver, are deaminated, are converted to urea, and are excreted through your urine. It doesn't account for that. This is, again, really, really rudimentary and really simplistic. 
Um, but what I really want to focus on is more of that picture on the right. And the reason I think that the calories in calories out model works isn't so much um, in reducing the size of the actual peak of that blip. I think by eating less food, you just generally have less area under that curve. Um, so every approach to weight loss in a sense works, but that's the reason why I think the calorie approach model works to an extent. I mean, obviously if you eat very, very, very small amounts of food, you're going to have some weight loss. Um, but I think it's a really bad approach. And I know I've talked quite a bit about calories, but we're going to get into some Jason Fung clips right now from just one of his videos where he mentions a number of different studies. And I thought instead of pulling up every single study individually and making the same points that he makes, it would just be a lot easier if um, I just went directly to his presentation. So I've um, picked a couple of time signatures. I have this on times two speed, so it's going to be a little bit quick. Um, but the first minute and a half or so of this, he talks about how under eating slows metabolism. And he gives a couple of examples here. So we'll get into that. In fact, it was done close to 100 years ago where they took 12 men and put them onto these so-called semi-starvation diets of 1,400 to 2,100 calories a day. And what was found was that the subjects, they did lose weight, but they constantly complained of being cold. And when you measure their basal metabolism, what you see that there is a very significant decrease, a 30% decrease in their metabolic rate. And that explains why they're cold. The body was shutting down. It's turning down heat production as a way of reducing caloric expenditure. So it turns out that you reduce your energy expenditure so much that if you go back to your regular diet after this uh, period, then what happens is that you start to gain fat. You start to gain weight. And they also uh, measured all these things, including decreases in blood, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, inability to concentrate. All these are manifestations of the body really starting to shut down. A similar study was done by Ansel Keys in 1944, where he took 36 men and put them on a 24-week uh, semi-starvation diet, 1,570 calories a day. And again, measured what happened to their metabolism. It turns out that the men's resting metabolic rates declined by 40%. So again, heart volume shrank, heart rate slowed, and the body temperature dropped. There's all kinds of psychological effects. Some people went actually completely crazy, uh, but they were obsessed about food and there was binge eating and all sorts of uh, problems. So what we see is that one of the key assumptions of the caloric reduction model is actually not true. That is, um, if you look at uh, caloric intake and caloric expenditure, they are very intimately linked. In fact, if you look at more recent data from the New England Journal of Medicine, a very prominent uh, medical journal from 1995, what they did was they measured something very similar. That is, they took people at an initial weight and they increased their weight by 10% or decreased it by 10%. And what they did then is they uh, looked at what their basal metabolism is. And what, how they did this was they adjusted their diet, uh, a liquid diet, and they gave them more or even less until they achieved what they wanted in terms of weight. And this is what you found in terms of uh, basal energy expenditure. That is, as you gain weight, your body actually starts to rev up and starts to burn off those calories. And as you lose weight, your body, while well, you return to initial weight, you go back to normal. As you lose weight, your body actually starts to shut it down. So, All right, so this is not what the calories in, calories out model would predict. Um, our calories in, calories out model basically says that our body's going to burn a certain number of calories every day through our basal metabolic rate. And we can increase that through activity. And then if we need to lose fat, we just need to be in a calorie deficit. Well, Fung just gave an example of three different studies showing that if – you eat in a calorie deficit for a long enough period of time, your body's going to slow its metabolic rates. Um, this is again is substantiated by Ponser's work. So this next example is going to show how the eat less, move more paradigm essentially doesn't work. And this video clip isn't quite as long. So let's see what happens in the real world, because really, this caloric reduction model, we've been testing it continuously. And probably the biggest uh, trial that's ever been done is the Women's Health Initiative Dietary Modification Trial. And this was started in 1993, and it was a huge, very expensive trial. 50,000 women, and they were enrolled to either a low-fat diet, rich in fruits, vegetables, and fiber, and uh, about 30,000, roughly, who just took kind of what they usually took. They used dietary counseling to make sure that people got what they thought they would get. And let's look at what happened. So if you look at total uh, energy, at baseline, they were taking 1,788 calories per day. And uh, at follow-up, they were taking 1,445 calories a day. So they were taking 361.4 calories less every single day. Uh, if you look at percentage fat, they went from 38.8% to 29.8%, uh, which is very good. That's exactly what they were trying to do. And as a result, the amount of energy from carbohydrate went up from 44% to 52%. Um, at the same time, they tried to exercise more. So if you look at the Mets per week, which is a unit of exercise, they went from uh, 10 to 11.4. In other words, they increased their physical activity by roughly 10%. So that's great. They ate less and they exercised more. So what happened to their weight? That's the question. So compared to the people with a normal diet, the people who took this very stringent uh, 360 calorie reduction diet every day plus increased exercise, they barely lost any weight compared to the usual group over a period of up to seven to nine years. There was barely any difference, less than one kilogram difference between the two groups. It simply doesn't work. So if you look at what uh, they should have lost, um, everybody says, oh, well, if you're reducing 360 calories a day and a pound of fat is uh, 3,000, you should have lost 36 pounds of fat in the first year alone. But in fact, their weight went from 76.8 kilos to 75.7 kilos, which is uh, barely a kilogram of weight loss. Um, but the problem with that is actually they lost lean mass as well as fat mass, because if you look at their waist circumference, it actually went up from 89 centimeters to 90 centimeters. So the cruel hoax of all these semi-starvation diets, or simply calorie-restricted, low-fat, calorie-restricted diets, is they do not work. 
okay, it has a perfect 35-year uh, track record unblemished by success because caloric deprivation triggers two adaptive mechanisms which are going to work against you. You're going to reduce your energy output and you're going to increase your hunger. So in the end... All right, so it's a fantastic study that Fung just pointed out, basically showing these women ate less and moved more, and they didn't lose nearly the amount of weight that the calories in, calories out model would project. And again, towards the end of that nine years of that study, their weight loss was, I think, less than one kilo, despite, uh, um, again, eating less, moving more, their average waist size increased, and they lost lean muscle mass. So this next clip is even shorter. Um, it talks about how during overeating, the body will increase the metabolism. And I forgot to look it up before this presentation, but I'm reminded of a study on protein overfeeding, where they had two groups. They had a control group um, that was given a certain baseline diet, and then they had a secondary group, which was given that same baseline diet, and then also 800 extra calories a day just coming from like one protein shake. Um, so if the calories in, calories out model was true, what you would expect was this group that was getting the protein shake every single day on top of the baseline diet, having 800 extra calories a day should gain um, over a pound a week every single day, excuse me, from having this added influx of calories. And at the end of either six or eight weeks, however long this particular study was, um, there was no difference in body composition or weight gain or weight loss between the two groups. This one group was getting 800 extra calories every single day, but didn't gain any more weight than the normal control group. Calories in, calories out does not work. Let's get back to Jason here. If you think that eating too much is really the cause of obesity, well, again, you can test that very simply. If you give people more to eat, then they should get fat. And these experiments have been done as well, ever since the 1960s, most uh, famously by an endocrinologist by the name of Ethan Sims. So he took convicts out of Vermont State Prison, and he initially did it in uh, college students, but he couldn't make them eat enough, so he took, you know, inmates, where you could control what they ate. And they were eating up to 4,000 calories a day, and their weight would go up, but then it kind of stabilized. Some wound up eating 10,000 calories a day. And when you measure their metabolic rate, their metabolism had increased by 50%. The body was simply trying to burn it off. Again, if we go back to the coal uh, analogy, if all of a sudden you're getting so much more coal, you're not just going to leave it. You're going to say, well, I have way too much coal. Let's burn it. And that's what the body does. If you look at this, published in the uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, they also took volunteers and they overfed them uh, for 42 days. Okay? And they followed a diet which is fairly standard uh, for North America, which is about 46% uh, carbohydrate. And what happened? Well, they all gained weight. But as you take them off of that forced feeding, they all go back towards their usual weight, except for this fellow who continued to gain weight. But all right. So this, again, is this is exactly what Ponser's uh, research would suggest, is that your metabolism will increase or slow down predominantly based on your body composition, but also your total body size. This next video um, talks about how exercise doesn't burn really that many calories. It's something that I've said before. You, uh, exercise, so uh, one that doesn't do very much, the increasing amounts of exercise. And what you can see is that there was actually no difference between all the groups. But if you look more closely, as you start to do more exercise, you actually start to lose less weight. If you look and again, that small subtle point, as you start to do more exercise, you lose less weight. The Ponsard's research also substantiates that. Um, in his constrained daily energy expenditure model, he has a graph in his book where he, he shows that doing extremely large amounts of activity for most individuals causes a precipitous drop off um, in activity and it's or sorry in calories burned that single day um, and this is not linear look at other trials in fact almost every trial that's been done has shown something very similar that is uh, published in obesity 2007 they took 100 men and 100 women and they put them on six days a week of one hour moderate to vigorous exercise and they wanted to see how much weight they lost so over one year so going from sedentary or zero exercise to uh, an hour a day of aerobics you lost about three pounds for women and four pounds for men so yes there is a difference but really a very very small difference um, a group of researchers in Denmark actually uh, took sedentary subjects and trained them to run a marathon with the thought that if a little bit of exercise is good for you well a lot of exercise must be good for you and the problem was that the men only lost about five pounds in weight and the women they didn't have any weight loss at all in fact they say that no change in body uh, composition was observed. That is, if you think that, well, they lost fat but gained lean muscle, well, in these women, they comment that they didn't see any difference in the amount of fat at all. And this is from going from sedentary to running a marathon. All right. So I think that's a really good point. Um, and again, this, this better comports to Ponser's model than it does the standard calories in, calories out model. And this last uh, small segment I'm going to point out, sorry, I took some notes here. Um, he kind of talks about insulin and fat. And I lately touched on this with ketosis. Sorry, I just want to look at the time signature. Uh, 44... 30. This was uh, the real reason I wanted to reference Jason Fung, and I'm not going to get into the hormonal model of obesity, um, linked to each other. but he points out a study that I really, really like. seen, and not independent. So insulin has uh, been used as a fattening agent for quite some time. In uh, 1923, it was first used as a, for underweight children, and in the 1930s, clinicians had started to use that already uh, for pathologically underweight children. And when they gave insulin, these kids would uh, gain weight. And the truth of the matter is that I can make you fat. I can make anybody fat. 
What do I do? I give them insulin. And any physician who's used insulin or any patient who's used insulin knows this to be true. It has nothing to do with a character defect or lack of willpower. When you take insulin, you get fat. So if you look at this study, which is from the diabetes uh, trial, the type 1 diabetes, the DCCT trial, you can see that they had two groups. So one group of diabetics, they actually had uh, very tight control of their sugars by giving more insulin. And the other group of patients, they had very loose control because they, um, that was the uh, trial at the time. And what you can see is that the number of people with a major weight gain was significantly different between the two. That is, the number of people who are using more insulin Almost 30% of those people had weight problems, major weight problems, compared to those who didn't use so much insulin. If you look at... Now, this is, um, this is again, this is correlation, and correlation cannot prove causation. I acknowledge that. Um, but he does point to a study here where people, I believe, were given increased insulin and decreased calories over time, but had increased uh, fat gain. So we'll get to that in a bit. At the amount of weight they gain and correlated to how much insulin they use, you can see there's a very strong correlation. That is, the, the total insulin dose, as it goes up, is correlated very strongly with the amount of weight that they would gain. If you look at type 2 diabetes, you actually see much the same thing. If you do intensive control of their diabetes by giving them more um, therapies that increase their insulin levels, they tend to gain more weight. Those ones that you don't control as tightly, they don't gain as much weight. In type 2 diabetes, they had a uh, trial a few years ago when they were really concerned about... All right, so this is the one I was talking about. Uh, ...controlling their glucose. And what they found was this. They took a group of people, a uh, group of um, diabetics, and they gave them intensive insulin therapy. And they went from zero units of insulin a day, and six months they had them up to 100 units a day of insulin. And what happened? Well, they all started to gain weight. And you can see that, again, there's a very tight correlation between the amount of insulin that you use and the total weight gain. In fact, the other interesting part about the study is that they gained on average 8.7 kilograms, but they also measured how much calories they're eating. So at baseline, they're eating 2,023 calories. By the end, they're eating 17, uh, 11 calories. That is, even though they were gaining weight, they were eating less and less. That is, they had reduced the amount of calories consumed by almost 15%. Yet under the influence of insulin, which is telling the body to get fat, they were still gaining weight. All right, so that was the, the biggest study that I wanted to point out. And I threw in the other ones. I knew the other ones were um, correlation. Again, correlation cannot prove or inform on causation. Um, but it, it gives an idea at least why hypothetically there might be some validity to this model that merits further investigation. And that last study that Fung pointed out, again, people uh, decreased their calories by what, two or 300 calories a day over the course of the study and ended up gaining 19 pounds. So um, this is in complete contradiction to the calories in, calories out model. This calories in, calories out is way too simplified. So let's get back to the presentation here. I want to make sure I have myself up correctly. All right. So I've kind of poo-pooed on cardio, um, but I do want to lightly touch on how to lose fat. Because I know that a lot of people that go to the gym, a lot of people that will sign up for um, different uh, exercise sessions, gyms, clubs, whatever, do so because they want to improve their health, but they also want to improve their body composition. I get that that's a big aspect of that for a lot of people. So I wanted to lightly touch on how to lose fat. Well, first, eat a species appropriate diet, which I believe is a carnivore diet, no plant foods whatsoever. But um, I get that a lot of people are going to struggle with that. So it's a, a general guiding principle, try and eat as few carbs as you can sustain. Um, follow your hunger and satiety signals to start with, especially your first month. If you try to go carnivore, um, you might have to eat more food than you're anticipating. And this happens with a lot of people that try carnivore for the first one to two months, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, if you're hungry, eat and eat until you're comfortably full. It's just red meat, salt, water, eggs, bacon. Um, and things will kind of even out a little bit for most individuals after that. Again, these are general guiding principles. I, I can't broadly speak about a population of people and, and issue rigid guidelines with what's going to work for everybody. And then from there, um, after your first at least a month, you can make the adjustments as necessary. You can adjust your fat to protein uh, macronutrients. You can adjust food volume. You can adjust food selection to kind of find your preferences and what works best with your body. Strength train. Strength training will increase your muscle mass, which will therefore increase your metabolism. It'll improve your flexibility, your cardiovascular conditioning, your joint composition, your strength, and your body composition provided that you exercise properly. Again, as general guiding principles, um, make, keep your workouts intense. Because they're intense, they have to be brief. And because exercise is a physical stress on the body, they need to be relatively infrequent. You need to allow enough time for the recovery and for the overcompensation to occur. Also, if you're, you're trying all these things, you can't seem to get it dialed in, don't be afraid to hire a coach. Uh, Jonathan Griffiths, I'll link him in the description. He's known as the composition consultant. Um, probably the best bang for your buck in terms of anyone who's looking to hire a coach to get in better shape or maybe restructure their exercise program. Bart K., the most knowledgeable guy I've heard online with respect to human physiology. 
Um, the man is the man is incredibly incredibly smart. Um, and if you have the money, I he would be well worth hiring, and I can't recommend him enough. Uh, Rob Goodwin, Rob, especially if you're looking to do any kind of like bodybuilding contest prep or um, preparation for any kind of competitive sport, both Rob or Jonathan would be excellent. So I can't recommend these three guys highly enough. Don't be afraid to hire a coach. Um, a few last points that I want to touch on because I don't want to completely be against all versions of cardio for all reasons. It can be great for your health and for your cardiovascular endurance. My main point of this video is just it's not good for weight loss. It is not good for weight loss. Be active, but do activities you enjoy. Exercise shouldn't be something that you're doing to punish yourself because you had a donut. It should be a celebration of what your body can do. It should be something that you do at the appropriate intervals because it's good for you. It's like showering. It's like brushing your teeth. Um, you do it because it's good for you, whether or not it's fun. And with that being said, I'm going to take a look here to see if anyone is in the chat. Doesn't look like I have anyone right now, so I won't be taking any questions. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Um, I will edit the comments, to provide links to Bart, Rob, and Jonathan's channels. Go and subscribe to them. Watch everything they do. These guys are excellent, and I can't recommend them highly enough. And uh, if you enjoyed this, let me know. If there's any other things you want me to talk about in future videos, uh, I will be happy to do that. Leave in the comments or contact me on social media. I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you for your time.